Well, hi, friends. My name is Matthew Dowling, Preaching Minister for the Plymouth Church of Christ. And we all know right now that there is a struggle when it comes to one particular aspect of the Christian life. And that is the sharing of the good news with other people, the good news of Jesus Christ, what we call evangelism. And yet we know from the Great Commission of Jesus Christ that we are commanded to go into all the world and to teach and to disciple and to baptize in the name of the triune God. And yet there's probably never been a time really in recent history where evangelism has been a struggle. And so I want to create an extensive series of training videos for you based upon the way of the master, which is Ray Comfort's Living Waters Ministries approach to evangelism. Now I'm creating these for my congregation that I serve and love, and I'm hoping that it will be an equipping tool which will help stir up uh, a spirit of evangelism, even a courage to share the good news and the hope that we have in our lives. Now, this is the first lesson in the School of Biblical Evangelism, and it's called the Forgotten Key to Biblical Evangelism. Now, I once heard a man who said, I am as good as any Christian. And he was really justifying why he believed after he died that he would go to something like heaven or whatever it was that he thought of heaven. Well, as soon as I heard that, I thought to myself, that's kind of a strange thing to say, because of course, we know from the Bible that a Christian by themselves isn't good. In fact, Jesus himself said that God alone is good. The fact is the only goodness or righteousness that a believer has actually comes from Jesus Christ. In fact, the Bible tells us that without Christ, human beings, they are corrupt. They're full of unrighteousness. And as the psalmist says in Psalm 14, 3, there is none that does good. No, not one. And so we begin with this reflection today. Perhaps you've maybe thought to yourselves, is there a key to reaching the lost? And the answer is, yes, there is a key. <laughs> and yet it's pretty rusty because it's not often used today. Now, the Bible doesn't actually call this thing the key. Uh, but its purpose, though, is to bring us to Christ, to unlock the door of the Savior. And not only is this key, if you will, biblical, but it actually was something that's been used for 2,000 years throughout church history to unlock the doors of evangelism and the doors even of revival, which is like when evangelistic fervor and the response to salvation breaks out in a big way. Now, much of the church actually doesn't even know that this key exists. And the problem is that it was actually lost about a century ago, around the turn of the 20th century. And like our own keys to our cars, sometimes uh, they get lost. But the fact is this key, well, it was used by Jesus. It was used by Paul. It was used by James. Uh, Stephen, the martyr, used it when he preached. Uh, Peter actually found that it was useful to open the door to many imprisoned souls when he preached using it on the day of Pentecost. And, um, and so we know that it's an important key. Now, why then, if it's so important, uh, has it been lost? Great question. I would say in an ultimate way, the reason it's been lost is because Satan has tried to prejudice the modern church against using the key. And so the enemy of the church has has, has misused it, he's twisted it, he's hidden it because he hates what it does. Now, at this point, you're probably like wondering, what is the key? I mean, get to the point, what is the key? And I will tell you, but I haven't asked before I tell you. All I ask is that you set aside maybe what you think about evangelism, what your tradition of evangelism is in your own mind, maybe even what your prejudice is, and let's think about what God's word says on the subject. So let me reveal to you what the key is. And I'm going to do that by going to God's word. So in Acts 28, verse 23, the Bible tells us that the apostle Paul, he sought to persuade his hearers concerning Jesus, it says, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets. So let me point out in this verse alone, there are two means, two keys of persuading 
the unsaved people concerning Jesus. So let's look first at how the prophets can help persuade sinners concerning Jesus. Fulfilled prophecy proves the inspiration of scripture. Uh, fulfilled prophecy, the predictions of the Old Testament prophets, they present a powerful case for a coming Messiah. In fact, they present a powerful case for the actual inspiration by God of the Bible. Any skeptic who reads the prophetic words of prophets like Isaiah or Ezekiel or Joel um, cannot help but be challenged to realize that the Bible, the Bible, excuse me, is no ordinary book. So that's the first way at how the prophets help persuade sinners. But the other means by which Paul persuaded sinners, and here's where the key comes in. How did Paul persuade sinners concerning Jesus? It says he persuaded them out of, did you notice, the law of Moses. So the Bible tells us that the law of Moses is good if it's actually used lawfully. In fact, Paul says in 1 Timothy 1 verse 8, he says, we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. So what purpose, for what purpose was the law, the law of Moses, the Old Testament law, summarized in the Ten Commandments, for example, for what purpose was God's law designed? And the following verse tells us in 1 Timothy 1, verses 9 and 10. Um, it says, the law is not made for a righteous person, but it is made for sinners. And, and Paul very helpfully here actually even lists the sinners for us. He says, they are the disobedient, the ungodly, murderers, people who have sex outside of marriage, homosexuals, gay uh, people, kidnappers, liars, etc. So the law was used to persuade sinners. In other words, the law was actually designed to be used as, did you notice, an evangelistic tool. Paul wrote in Romans 7 verse 7 that he actually didn't know what sin was, except that the law told him that the law revealed it to him. So the law of God, and I think the easiest way to think about what the law of God specifically is, is to think about the Ten Commandments. The law of God, the Ten Commandments, and we're going to talk in subsequent lessons about what those commandments are. The law of God is the key of knowledge that's useful in evangelism. In fact, Jesus mentioned this key in uh, Luke 11, verse 30, uh, verse, verse 52, excuse me. He said, woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You yourselves did not enter and you hindered those who were entering. Now, Jesus here is speaking to lawyers, those who should have been teaching God's law so that sinners would understand and have a knowledge of sin so that they would need or understand their need of a savior. And so, uh, there are two ways of persuading. There is the prophecies about Christ, the prophecies of the Bible. We can see how God has fulfilled those prophecies. They point to the Savior. They point to the inspiration of the Bible. That's very persuasive. And prophecy speaks to the intellect of the sinner. So we can argue with people about, for example, the inspiration of the Bible by showing them prophecy. But the law is altogether something different, this key to evangelism. You see, the law speaks to a very special part of our being, which the Bible calls the conscience, okay? Now, the first prophecy, Paul said, this actually produces faith or trust in the word of God. That's very good intellectually. But this other thing, the law, which speaks to the conscience, this other thing, the law brings knowledge of sin to our very hearts. And so what is the key? <laughs> the key very simply is the law. The law is the God-given key to unlock the door of salvation. That's why David can say in Psalm 19, 7, that the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. You see, scripture makes it very clear that it is the law that actually works upon the conscience to bring us to a conviction of sin so that we yearn for the mercy of God. That's how it converts the soul. In fact, maybe I just need to illustrate for a moment the function of God's law. Think about our own civil law uh, today. 
Imagine if I said to you, my friend, I've got some good news for you. Someone has just paid a $25,000 speeding fine on your behalf. Well, if I just walked up to you and I said that to you, you'd probably react by saying, you know, what are you talking about? Uh, that's not good news. It doesn't make sense. I don't have a $25,000 speeding fine. Well, you see, my good news would actually not be good news to you. It would seem foolish. But more than that, it actually might even offend you because I'm insinuating you've broken the law when you don't think that you have. However, if I came up to you and I put it in this way, maybe it would make more sense. Maybe I said to you, you know, my friend, while you were out today, the law clocked you going 55 miles an hour through an area set aside where blind children play. There were 10 very clear warning signs stating that 15 miles an hour is the maximum speed, but you actually went straight through all those signs and through that area at 55 miles an hour. What you did was extremely dangerous and it broke the law in a big way. And now there's actually a $25,000 fine. Now that law and that fine was about to take its course but someone actually that you don't even know stepped in and paid that fine for you. You are really, really lucky that that happened. Well, in that example, can you see that telling you what you precisely have done wrong actually enables the good news that follows to make sense to you? You know, if I don't clearly bring understanding that you violated the law, then that good news, it's going to seem foolish, maybe even offensive to you. But once you've understood that you've broken the law, then that good news becomes really, really good news indeed. Well, it's the same way. If I approach a sinner who's not repentant at all, who doesn't understand that they have a need of a savior, and I say, hey, great news, Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. For many people, maybe not all, but most, it's going to be pretty foolish, maybe even offensive to that person. First off, it'll be foolish because it just won't make sense to them. They don't even get it. What, what do you mean I'm a sinner? I don't know that I've done anything wrong. You know, that's why Paul, for example, in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18 says that the preaching of the cross is to them that are perishing, are dying. It's foolishness. And so it'll be foolish, but it also will be offensive because I'm insinuating that person is a sinner when they don't think that they are. I mean, as far as they're concerned, there's a lot of people far worse than them. But if I actually take time to use the lost key of evangelism to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, it may actually make more sense. And the way that I do that is I open up the divine law, the Ten Commandments, and I show that person exactly where it is that they've gone wrong, really that all people, those areas that they've gone wrong, that actually that person has offended God by breaking those laws, okay? That when it comes to our standing before God, the law is actually what judges us. And when that person then hears that and, and the conscience begins to work and they actually become convinced that, as it stands with the law, they have broken it. The good news of the fine being paid by Jesus will no longer be foolishness, but they'll understand, wow, I really needed that debt to be paid. And so it won't be offensive. It will um, be uh, what Paul calls in Romans 1 verse 16, the power of God unto salvation. And so with that in mind, just to conclude this uh, first teaching video on the forgotten key to biblical evangelism, I want to consider some of the functions of God's law for humanity, why the law is relevant, important today, especially in the task of evangelism. Romans 3 verse 19 says this, it says, now we know that whatsoever things the law says, it says to them who are under the law that every mouth would be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. So, Listen very closely. One function of God's law, according to Paul here, is to stop the mouth, to keep a sinful person from trying to justify themselves by saying, hey, Matthew, you know what? Look, 
there's plenty of people worse than me. I mean, I haven't murdered anybody. I haven't done anything like that. I'm not a bad person, really. Well, when we open up the law to them to say, look, this is how every one of us every day, sometimes every moment of the day, break and violate God's law. And we show that, then they realize, look, the standard is not whether or not I've murdered somebody or if I'm a better person than that person or that criminal or whatever the case is. No, the question is, have I actually broken God's law? And by breaking it, sinned, by transgressing the law, and then by sinning, actually, be under the, the judicial judgment of God that I will uh, die in my sins eternally. You see, when you show that to people using the law, well, the law, it kind of shuts down the rationalizing, doesn't it? It stops the mouth. It stops the mouth of a person justifying themselves. And it leaves uh, the whole world actually in an awareness of uh, a person's guilt. In fact, in Romans 3, verse 20, the very next verse, it says this. It says, by the deeds of the law, there shall uh, be no flesh justified in God's sight. For the law is the knowledge of sin. <laughs> Excuse me. And so God's law tells us what sin is. It, it shuts down our rationalizing that we're actually good people. The law tells us what sin is. It shows us where we've sinned. First John 3 verse 4 says that sin is breaking of God's law. And in Galatians 3.24, we learn that God's law actually acts like a teacher, a tutor. And it leads us to understand that we need Jesus Christ. It actually brings us to Jesus Christ, yearning for being justified through faith in his blood. And so in a weird way, the law, it doesn't help us per se, but it leaves us helpless, which is really the point we have to get to in order to be helped by Christ. The law doesn't justify us. There's no amount of good works or law keeping that we can do that will make us righteous. The law actually leaves us guilty before the judgment bar of a holy God. Listen to this quote to close by Charles Spurgeon, who was the 19th century prince of preachers in Great Britain. He stated this. He said, I do not believe that any man can preach the gospel who does not preach the law. The law is the needle. And you cannot draw the silken thread of the gospel through a man's heart unless you first send the needle of the law to make way for it. And so the law is that which converts the soul. And it's a, a, a blessed, a blessed uh, thing. And so I'm going to leave it there today. The forgotten key to biblical evangelism here in lesson one is the law of God summarized in the Ten Commandments. Lord willing, in our next video, lesson two, I'm going to talk about making grace amazing. And the only way that grace is ever really going to make sense to us or become beautiful is then when we see it in light of actually God's holy law. And so I look forward to sharing with you more about uh, the uh, evangelistic training that we're going to be doing together. And I thank you for watching this video. I hope it's helped to you. And I hope that you'll watch each one of these as a way of stirring up your love of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ uh, uh, with lost people. Let me remind you as we close that God is good all the time and all the time God is good. And until next time, dear friends, may God bless you.